Good afternoon. I thought this uh, popular meme type would be a good way to kind of introduce my topic, which is, what is a Mormon? On the surface, that sounds like a pretty simple question, but in reality, is, uh, has a lot of complexity to it, and a question that I've been tackling for the last five to six years. Uh, since about the mid-20th century, the LDS Church has tried to shape its own impression of what a Mormon is. Uh, more recently, with the 2010 uh, I'm a Mormon campaign, where they're subtly putting out the idea that a Mormon is more than just that. They're a father, they're a blogger, they're a doctor, a dentist, and oh, by the way, they're also a Mormon. Uh, internally, the church has also tried to define what a Mormon is as something more uh, normal. If you see here is a, a simple search uh, from 1971 to 2015 on the term peculiar people. Uh, the church has stopped using that phrase in most of its uh, vernacular. And then also internally amongst Mormons, this is a list of, of different terminology that I've found uh, in the last few years of how we define ourselves as well as how other non-Mormons define us uh, uh, additionally. So this led to uh, a research project that I started in 2015 wanting to know how others defined us, how others uh, saw what Mormonism is. And so I started attending local Comic-Con conventions with artists asking them to draw or illustrate what they know, or how they feel about Mormons, whether it be good, bad, or ugly. And these are some of the results that I've gotten. Of course, polygamy is one that uh, can't be escaped as part of what the Mormon identity is. Uh, or how people perceive Mormons. But I also wanted to share with you some unintended uh, data that I learned from doing this project as well. Overall, I had, I've gathered 166 illustrations from uh, seven different venues, mostly in North America and one in Europe. Uh, from that, uh, I've spent about $17,000 <laughs> uh, acquiring these images. The purpose is to approach the artist, let them determine what it is they want to draw, and also determine how much uh, uh, they feel they need for the project uh, to go forward. So I don't haggle. I don't question what it is that they want. I want them to have complete control uh, over the project from it. And you can see some of these have uh, statements that people are making about the church, how they feel about Mormons the way they perceive what a Mormon is. Uh, some of the interesting data I've gathered from it that, I, like I said, I hadn't intended to. Um, it's been more of a challenge to find uh, women artists to accept the project. Uh, they tend to uh, uh, pass on doing such, such a thing uh, often uh, far more than men. Uh, on average, for Men, I have paid about $153 uh, per illustration. Uh, for uh, Mormon men, I have paid on average $69 per image. For women, I've paid an average of $70 per image. And for uh, uh, Mormon women, $49 per image. Of this uh, 28, of these illustrations, uh, 28 of the illustrations created by men, I paid over $200 for. Uh, only four pay, I, uh, charged me over $200 for their illustrations of Mormon men. Only three women charged me over $200 uh, for their work, and no uh, Mormon artist or illustrator has asked for more than $200 uh, up to this point as well. Missionaries, as you can see, tend to be the biggest theme, uh, accounting for about 42% of all of the illustrations I received. They range from uh, stoic to the more comical, as portrayed uh, in the Book of Mormon musical style of illustration. Uh, 
Interesting about this one, when I asked the artist why she chose to draw a missionary with no face, her response is because she never remembers their faces. She only remembers their smiles and uh, their uh, kindness when she's out on the street. So although missionaries are predominant, the uh, symbolism often is uh, uh, not properly portrayed. You can see missionaries with crosses going uh, man and woman, of course, not traditional um, missionary style. And then one of the more interesting missionary images, which I think is pretty quintessential, this artist told me he would draw what he knew and what he felt about Mormons, which you get a zombie missionary with his polygamous vampire wives biting into the Book of Mormon, infecting it, so to speak, spreading slowly across the land, almost as a plague. Uh, these are different examples of how members have uh, portrayed what Mormonism is or what a Mormon is uh, to them. And then in closing, uh, I think maybe what I've seen uh, the, as the best example comes from the artist uh, Joey Gates, who is famous for the Stripling Warriors Mama Boys uh, t-shirts that are so predominant, with his work, which he titled simply Complex. Thank you. Hi, we'll go from the um, very illustrative to the very dry and academic with my work, so buckle in. Okay. So, as Laura introduced, my work is really, uh, it really spans genres and media. Um, the sort of key in the center of my work is this concern with knowledge, both uh, learned and personal knowledge, the means by which that knowledge is gained, um, and the ways in which that knowledge can sometimes have little gaps or seeps or, um, or moments of failure. I look for places where systems generating knowledge are at work, from scientific field work by 19th century naturalists to architectural spaces like these churches, which I documented all over Europe and then compressed into single images, trying to get kind of at the core of what felt so universal about my experiences in these places. Um, I also felt that personally relevant architecture um, was very important to explore despite the relative youth of Mormonism we have specific structures, specific visual codes that we use to designate our, our areas of worship, our buildings, our landscapes, and they have kind of a feel. You can tell immediately when you're in front of a Mormon temple. Um, I have done explorations of this concept by looking at the Plat of Zion, the um, Joseph Smith's utopian uh, vision of what a city could look like, and trying to design what a utopian version of a temple could look like. Um, this is a 3D printed model that I did of, of what my designs turned out to be. Um, I also think that there's something kind of beautiful about the simplicity of other Mormon architectures as well, like the meeting houses that are all the same. Really, I think of that as a very egalitarian gesture. Um, we don't look up in awe in this beautiful cathedral-like space, right? We look across at our fellow church members. Um, there are other things that are common in our visual culture. The general conference has such a specific sound, such a specific look. Um, this is a still from a video that I made um, where I took two performances of Come Let Us uh, Rejoice that occurred three years apart and I compressed them into one image and they're almost exactly shot for shot the same. They're really cool. This is just kind of a fragment of what my work is like, so just so for some context. For the most part, I'm going to be talking about what uh, we did downstairs, which is uh, One Great Hold, the um, collaborative drawing exhibition that I put together alongside uh, Kirk. So um, this was really exciting for me because I'm interested in communal knowledge and communal explorations of um, belief and expressions of that. Um, I really loved uh, Laurel's uh, quote last night where she talked about Mormon church not being a genius of individuals, but a genius of a collective, right? Um, each project responds to a different doctrinal prompt. Kirk's project involves over 240 contributors, a ton. 
you could not believe there were so many Mormon artists out there, but there are. Um, each of whom created plates responding to, quote, the things of their souls. Um, uh, his project is called Handed Down and Altered, and he describes it as a meditation on canonized scripture as collaborative art. Intended to loosely mirror the creation and compilation of scripture, the project encourages participants to think about questions of personal faith, of individuality within community, and processes by which holy text comes together. Um, this is a really beautiful project. I encourage you to look at it. The one that I organize is called The Spirit World. And um, it's based on this thing that I discovered actually while I was preparing a lesson for my laurels on the spirit world. And um, it's from the discourses of Brigham Young. It says, the brightness and glory of the next apartment is inexpressible. Yonder they move with ease and like lightning. If we want to visit Jerusalem or this, that, or the other place, we, there we are looking at its streets. If we want to be behold it as it was in the days of our savior, or if we want to see the Garden of Eden as it was when it was created, there we are. And we see it as it existed spiritually, for it was created first spiritually and temp then temporarily. And spiritually, it still remains. Um, God has revealed some little things with regard to his movements and power, and the operation and motion of the lightning furnish a fine illustration of the ability of the Almighty. When we pass into the spirit world, we shall possess a me measure of this power. This is a really long quote. It goes on and on and on, and it's beautiful. Um, I just loved this idea of the spirit world being this place that um, collapses time and space and allows you to experience uh, all of humanity kind of at once. Um, the artist had very different responses. Amanda Smith's is very personal. It has to do with family mythology, personal um, experiences with mental illness, um, neural phenomena. Um, Ron Lynn was influenced, weirdly enough, by Hieronymus Bosch and the landscapes that are populated by tons and tons and tons of little figures. He loved the idea of those little figures forming relationships and families and, and traveling together across these, these giant landscapes. Um, Madeline Rupard's work, as you'll see later when she talks, is already concerned with spanning time and space. She collapses medieval cathedrals and playground structures and dogs fighting each other all into um, these, these disparate things all occupy the same world and are all part of the same continuation of history. Um, Nick Bontorno uh, engages with this in a much more kind of simplistic or folkloric way. Um, he depicts figures from myth and using kind of an American folk art influence style uh, tries to make those relevant to us today. Uh -huh. My own project uh, was semi-autobiographical, which I never ever do, but I thought, when, what better time than now? But it's an imagination of the Garden of Eden as every park that I've ever been in and loved collapsed into one space, but I get to visit it with my baby daughter and show her all the beautiful places that I love so much. So, very cheap, corny, but whatever, I love it. Um, <laughs> Colin Bradford's piece is by far the most abstract, but I'm very excited by it. It feels like it exists sort of either before creation or after the end of the physical world. It has this big boulder kind of tumbling down through space into this dark void. Um, and I think it's, it's interesting to see that that happens kind of outside of time. So in this collaborative drawing project, basically, these artists' conceptions of the spirit world form a single landscape. You can read it either as a unified image or as a series of shifts between radically different environments. By crossing from one panel into the next, the viewer can be at one moment like floating in above a mountain range with a bunch of spirits or um, at the next moment in a seashore. And I love that, that this project allowed those visions to kind of come together in one great whole. Thank you. Okay, we're going to switch gears again uh, to something that has very little to do directly with Mormonism except uh, how much Mormons love puns and uh, the Kenneth Branagh much ado about nothing. Okay, um, here we go. I'll tell you a little bit about my background because that helps you understand uh, why I study what I do. I got a music degree from BYU, a humanities degree from Chicago, a PhD in English from Fordham, and then now I'm a professor at BYU starting this fall. So that's a little bit of what I bring, kind of the study, and I want to combine all these disciplines together. A lot of times people will focus on the abstract ideas of music uh, or literature. I'm interested, because of my background as a choir director, a manager of a choir, et cetera, 
and performing soprano, I'm interested in the practice and the sound of how music comes through literature. So that's kind of my research focus. Um, so I study the early modern period, which is the late 15th to the 18th century. We've got Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, James I, King James Bible. His son gets killed. No king for a while. Then we get, uh, sorry, that... The thing was sliding, so I had to catch it. Um, so then we get no king for a while, and then uh, another king, George, um, uh, King George, who is a king during the Enlightenment and during the American Revolution. Uh, this is all happening during this period that I study, the early modern period. Okay, also during this period, music moves from being a science to an art. So in the 1500 or so, it would still be studied in universities, in medieval universities, alongside geometry and astronomy and arithmetic. And by the 18th century, it's grouped much more often with poetry and with theater, and it's seen as art with a performance focus. And so I'm interested in this 17th century transition period, the messy middle. You can see Philip Sidney talks about the planet-like music of poetry. He's thinking about astronomy and poetry in connection with music. William Shakespeare talks about the power of music over bodies. Um, we have also coming up uh, John Milton. He equates music as being part of the creation in his poem, uh, Ode on the Morning of Christ's Nativity. And then Gerald Langbang by 1691, he's including opera composers among dramatic poets. So they really kind of don't know where to put music for a little while. It's spanning both science and art. And this transition period is really interesting to me. Part of this transition is when music starts to be treated as rhetoric, that it has something to say, and that we get the development of tone painting and opera and recitative. And I want to know how did music say whatever they thought it could say. So this is the question I'll be asking of Much Ado About Nothing, the play um, that we'll look at here. Just to review the plot for you, the soldiers come home from war. There's two love plots. Claudio pursues Hero. Benedict and Beatrice fight all the time, but they get tricked into thinking that they're in love with each other. And then Don John tricks Claudio and everybody into thinking that Hero's been unfaithful. Everybody's mad. She dies. And then he's revealed as a fraud. Don John is. Hero's alive after all. Everybody's happy. OK. Where does music come up in this? Um, I want to focus on puns. So we look at the title, Much Ado About Nothing. Nothing can mean triviality and sexuality, but also it would have been pronounced noting, so it can mean noticing and music. So the sound of the way you say it makes a difference in how the pun is understood. Speaking of puns based in sound, um, this is one of my favorites. What is Whitney Houston's favorite kind of coordination? Hand eye, hand eye coordination, okay? So the point is that, that sound matters in puns, okay? And this is what we're looking for, for how music helped make meaning in this play. We're gonna look at this uh, scene. Well, this is the scene that showcases the pun in the title. The prince says to the musician, if thou wilt hold longer argument, do it in notes. And the musician says, note this before my notes. There's not a note of mine worth the noting. And they go on and on about notes and noting as a musical pun. OK. Now, this scene between Hero and Beatrice and Margaret, their gentlewoman, talks a lot about sound. So if you'll see on the last two lines here, Hero hears Beatrice speak and says, do you speak in the sick tune? And Beatrice says, I'm out of all other tune, methinks. So her voice sounds sick. She sounds sick like this or something, and Hero's worried about her health. Beatrice says in the scene, I am exceeding ill, hey ho. And her gentlewoman says, for a hawk, a horse, or a husband. And Beatrice says, for the letter that begins them all, H. Now the pun here is in the way they pronounced H, just like the way they pronounced nothing or noting. H, the letter, is the way we would say it, but the word ache also was pronounced H. And you can see this in 1576, a little epigrammatic book, says H is the worst among the letters in the cross row, for if thou find him, H, in other than thine elbow, wherever thou shalt find ache slash H, thou shalt not like him. So they've got this pun that you have to understand by means of the sound. And um, I'm going to listen to the way this song, Hey Ho for a Husband, sounds. Hey, oh, for a husband, take, oh, for a husband, still this was a song. Okay, so my contention is that in that line, hey ho, she would have maybe said hey ho, and the audience would have recognized the, the sound even if she wasn't singing the song. Same scene, claps into Light of Love. Light of Love is another song. It has a lot of puns with I'll dance and uh, being a little promiscuous, and Margaret says, I'll scorn that with my heels. You can see that they might have 
taken these lines and danced a little bit as they deliver them. So part of the pun is the song itself. Here's the song. If you follow along with the words, you can see that this talks about all the meanings of nothing or noting, all the puns, triviality, sexuality, noticing, and music. They're all packed into this song that gets referred to in the scene, okay? And so you can see, just reviewing the scene all together, how many puns there are and the way that music is, is making up part of the meaning and through its sound, uh, referencing sound through its puns in the, in the play. So what are these puns doing? I want to say that a pun manages multiple meanings with one linguistic signifier, that's a word, and is often based in sound. It invites us to hear extra meaning, and the music takes on this form of the pun by opening multiple meanings and inviting us to hear that. And that's, that's kind of one, one argument for how music makes meaning in Much Ado About Nothing. So it goes back to this scene. If thou wilt hold longer argument, the prince says, do it in notes. And I want to say that this argument that music can make is part of how it functioned as it moved from a science to an art. Thanks. <clears throat> Um, today I want to talk a little bit about musical activism. That's kind of the, the theme of my presentation, um, particularly in the context of the Hopi Music Project. Uh, I've been working with the Hopi Tribe for about 10 years now. Uh, the Hopi Tribe is located in northeastern Arizona, um, but traditional Hopi lands extend to the neighboring states, uh, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico, as well as that orange spot, which was over the Grand Canyon. <laughs> um, so my story starts with a woman named Laura Bolton. Laura Bolton was uh, an early ethnomusicologist. She was a um, song collector, and she loved to collect indigenous music, particularly indigenous ceremonial music. Now, Bolton self-proclaimed herself uh, the music hunter. And uh, the reason was because she enjoyed going in, uh, find, she found it adventurous to find new songs and to bring them back and sell them to the world. Um, when she went to my village of Hot Villa on the Hopi Reservation, she met these two gentlemen, Thomas Banyaka and David Menunya, both of whom would become indigenous activists. She recorded several tracks with them and then uh, without compensating them and without giving them royalties, um, she went ahead and published them, first on RCA Victor and then on Smithsonian Folkways Records. And you can actually still buy these songs for 99 cents on iTunes, 89 cents on Amazon, or you can stream them for free on Spotify. Um, now, this particular story is very common. It's a drop in the bucket when you think about the tens of thousands of song recordings from indigenous communities around the United States that are available for free to the public that have never been uh, the compensation has never been given back to the tribes or to the individuals. Um, it's important to keep in mind that this all happened during a period of conquest and colonization when these indigenous communities were, um, the, kid, the children were being kidnapped and taking to, taken to boarding schools or off of uh, traditional lands. And so uh, as, as in the picture displayed here, um, the lives of many indigenous communities were taken at that same time. The Hopi Music Project uh, was born in 2008 as a means of bringing back these songs to the communities. Not only just the, the sounds uh, on a physical medium, but also bringing back the intellectual property rights. And there are a couple of ways that one could go about this, uh, legally speaking. So one could be turning over the copyrights to these materials. Fortunately, uh, not many of them are under copyright. or the copyrights on them are very limited. Um, there's also the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Uh, it's a law that allows tribes to reclaim sacred objects. There are also tribal laws. Unfortunately, none of these mechanisms are very well grounded in, in tribes' notions of law or justice. Um, so the Hopi Music Project has been uh, going out to the reservations, meeting with various stakeholders, and trying to understand how these indigenous communities understand the law uh, surrounding the ownership of these types of intangible things. One of the things we found out while we were uh, meeting with people is that for Hopi people at least, um, music is created and it functions in a totally different way than our standard art forms uh, 
or even music. Um, it's not a product of the individual genius, uh, and it doesn't circulate that way. Instead, it's a collective creation, and it's meant to provide benefit to the whole. Uh, collective prosperity is the goal of all these songs. Um, they're created through interactions with the land, and in that way, they're meant to create um, ideal growing conditions for local crops. Uh, interestingly, though, a lot of students out there, uh, teenagers and young adults, are also interested in having these songs available to the public. Um, they're interested in garnering recognition for Hopi creativity in the, in the global information economy. And so we have, for example, uh, a large percentage of Hopi students who are interested in having them out there in the world. Um, we also found in our work with the Hopi tribe that a lot of the songs that were recorded by people like Laura Bolton were actually borrowed from other tribes. And we uncovered these vast networks of exchange between Native American tribes. They aren't the solitary, um, uh, bounded communities that we so often talk about. Um, and in particular, we had a, a radio broadcast with Hopi and Zuni elders where they talked about this long history of millennia of exchange between the various tribes, uh, in which this exchange actually constituted the two cultures. Um, then finally, we've been working to help create new material. Um, the composer here, Clark Tenakomba, uh, wanted to venture out into new genres. He wanted to create a concert music version of traditional songs that he had written. And so we were able to fundraise and find uh, a venue for him to sing uh, some new work of his own. It started with the pilgrimage that we took, uh, him and I, and as well as some other Hopi men, down into the Grand Canyon, one of our most sacred places. And on that pilgrimage, um, he produced several of the songs from the new work. And in, in those moments, the nine day river rafting trip that we took, um, we were able to reconnect with some of the most important places and, and territories that impact our everyday lives. Um, you can see here there are markings, petroglyphs, and also uh, cliff dwellings and things like that. This is our genealogy that's still embedded in the land. And as we visit and offer prayers and make offerings, um, we reconnect with that genealogy. At the same time as we were visiting, um, the Navajo Nation and uh, an Arizona developer were trying to create a new tourist destination at the bottom of the Grand Canyon over the top of one of the Hopi tribe's most sacred places. And in doing so, they would have destroyed some of those sacred, spite, some of those sacred spots. So as part of uh, Tanakamwa's piece, he actually incorporated some references to that. He sings, I pity you, people because essentially you are disrespecting the Grand Canyon in your actions. And then he issues a command at the very end, a very clear uh, directive, do not disrespect it, every one of you that's listening. It was a moment where Hopi people were able to exercise their sovereignty over the land in a space that had been taken over by the federal government uh, in a very powerful way that had been broadcast throughout the region. And it was very impactful for all those who were there. Um, I, not that there's a direct correlation, but uh, for us, it was a huge blessing to see that um, shortly after this performance, the Navajo Nation rescinded their um, proposal to develop that part of the Grand Canyon. And fortunately, um, that hasn't been renewed, and so the Hopi tribe will be able to um, maintain their attachments to that land. So, thank you. Uh, just a quick disclaimer for any confusion. I am not an accomplished dancer, unfortunately, um, or a member of the band The Fictionist that is based out of Utah. So just thought I'd start with that. Um, so um, I'm, yeah, I'm so excited to be here. I um, thought I'd start out with a little image from when I was 13, year old, 13 years old, um, because I think it kind of shows the prime motivation of uh, most of my work actually, which is to kind of convey the power and interest that narrative has always had held sway over my heart. 
And illustration was actually where I started um, in my career. I started at BYU studying that and found that sometimes I felt um, constricted by story, actually, even though I, it was something that really motivated me. Um, and this was a project that I was working on uh, about eight years ago. And um, as I started to add um, elements that were not in the fairy tale that I was trying to depict, um, I felt that the boundaries of painting really opened up for me, and that um, by adding my sister into this fairy tale narrative, even though she didn't belong there, um, this was kind of a stepping stone to the rest of my work, and I was grateful for my, my peers and my professors for challenging me that, in that way, and I found the sketchbook was a real exciting place for me to experiment with imagery sourced from very different um, materials, such as art history, friends of mine, uh, Utah landscapes, things that were surrounding me. Uh, and as I dug further into, into this world, I found that even forms were starting to lose shape and um, abstraction um, appeared in my paintings. And sometimes they were objects such as, um, like from, sourced from funny places, like this is a salad bar at Chuckarama, but it's in this painting in the foreground <laughs> of a very abstract, what I considered like a very melancholy piece. Um, and as I started to um, experiment with that, I started to experiment as well with the format of a painting and started adding on more canvases into a triptych to um, Try, uh, try my hand at installation and painting as installation. I took a break, went to Hungary for a year and a half to serve a mission, and found myself staring outside of uh, trains a lot of the time onto these golden, um, clear landscapes, and uh, found them to be, um, to hold some kind of deep memory for me. I had ancestry in that country and felt, um, got interested in the idea of like a collective memory that we might have or might have share with our ancestors and places and came back and started applying that to my paintings and kind of with a new optimism believed in forms and representation again and used images from again art history and friends outside on the, in the backyard and um, put together a show that was um, an, uh, an immersive painting experience so this is me with one of the paintings, there was another one mirroring, mirroring um, with different images on it, and uh, a small square canvas at the top, kind of like the nave of a cathedral. Um, and I think artists, a lot of the time, were reacting against our past work. So uh, I started a book project after I graduated um, and took a year off between, between BYU and grad school. And so this, this project is actually ongoing. You can read it on my website. Uh, sometimes I make copies of it, but it's called Old World, New World, and it's uh, very much like a casual essay from my perspective, journalistic in nature, written with images that are, I'm drawn to um, that kind of are strung along by the text. And so this is, again, that landscape of like the European pastoral, and it's in a part where I'm talking about um, origin stories and how we might forget them or how we might dwell on them as Americans. I spent a lot of time in cathedrals, wandering around uh, in spaces, thinking about uh, places my grandma, Victoria from Hungary, uh, probably, she, I know she was very devout uh, Roman Catholic before she moved to America. And yeah, again, kind of bringing up that idea of collective memory, like um, even if you're not, if you, even if you are an American and you don't have European ancestry, it's everywhere in our culture, in fairy, like Disney movies and fairy tales. Um, I think the funny thing about it is how it changes a lot. So the, the book itself starts off with me on an airplane talking about um, kind of having an existential crisis, actually. And it's very direct. It's actually what was going through my brain. And I just wrote it down and started um, taking image, uh, photos that I could paint of the experience of being in this strange blue contemporary space of an airplane, <laughs> thinking about where we come from. Um, and the book kind of goes on. Um, I've only completed the first two sections of it, but so far they, um, t it talks a lot about like the original kind of aesthetic of, of uh, European um, culture and then the way we've transformed it into like cosplay, <laughs> Renaissance fair, uh, Casinos. Uh, this is Excalibur in Las Vegas, and the kind of funny um, transformation and way that we appropriate uh, even our like our own heritages, our own memories um, of an old world into 
these kind of places of pleasure or fun or entertainment. The book project kind of led me to um, single images that I painted um, on canvas with oil, which was important to me because of how contemporary the subjects were. I wanted, I wanted it to um, still hold, hold some history in the material. So these are images of grocery store sections of flowers and um, drive through. Um, these are actually both uh, smaller canvases painted in oil of, of places that actually have a true beauty to me, like gas stations and highways, um, as like a, a very symbolic uh, image of uh, America, especially Western America. This is a very fresh project, so it's a little bit vulnerable, but um, I've been looking at altarpieces lately and find them another really interesting way of compiling stories all into one single frame, S because um, even though you might, they might have them arranged from A to Z, you don't really look at it, you look at them all at once, and they are all individual segments, but they are connected to a whole, so mo my most recent work is um, these kind of banal altarpieces with maybe a, a reference to Northern Renaissance ideas of the Virgin Mary or f a painting of friends, and then um, again uh, composed with smaller paintings that have to do more with what's around us and the world we live in now. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Marin Roper, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, this is a picture of me in 2002. Uh, describing this caught suspension in high space, my sternum is wide and rising, arms, legs, and head reaching, or perhaps being pulled away from, my navel center. I yearn for the high space, however fleeting the moment may be. At this time, I'm pursuing my MFA in modern dance at the University of Utah. While stewing over a topic for my MFA thesis, a member of my thesis committee asks me, hypothetically, Marin, what is the one thing that will set you apart from others in this field? What will make your perspective unique? My chest tightens, my breath shallows, tears well. I'm a Mormon. Over the next two years, I examine the relationship between my worldview, as shaped by my experience as a Latter-day Saint, and my artistic process as a dance artist. For example, uh, my goals when I step out on stage to perform, my assumptions when I step into the studio to choreograph. I began making a stab at describing the physical sensations associated with the Holy Spirit, whether experienced at church or on a stage. A few months after graduation, I eagerly attended a work in progress showing by a Cambodian choreographer working with classical Khmer dancers at the Royal University of Fine Arts in Phnom Penh. I had high and very specific expectations as I sat down to witness this dance form associated with the ancient temples and was shocked and confused when I didn't feel anything. I came away from the subsequent Q&A session considering the possibility that others felt physical experience of the sacred is different than mine. See, I think we have a little uh, something going on with our borders. I'm sorry about that. Um, one moment, please. I moved to New York City in 2005 and began a modern dance company, Meld Dance Works, to continue exploring the relationship between artistic and spiritual identity and to hopefully give space for other dance artists to do the same. Projects included Sydney Ann's Apple, a humble declaration of the divine feminine, light traces in collaboration with 26 Mumbai-based dancers through the Cultural Envoy Program of the US State Department, and foundations celebrating the spiritual footings and foundations of an interfaith cast of dancers. The most recent chapter in my artistic and spiritual journey has come through immersion in the field of somatics. Somatics, a term coined in 1979 by Thomas Hanna, <clears throat> is a field within body work and movement studies that prioritizes internal physical sensation of the mover 
over the external visual experience of the audience. Um, my specific area of somatic study is Laban movement analysis, not Laban. A theory that describes human movement in terms of one, what the body is doing at a neuromuscular level, two, the qualitative effort of that movement, three, how the body shapes and forms itself in relationship to the environment, and four, where movement happens within the spatial matrix. My research as a dance artist and educator revolves in and around the intersection of somatics, cultural studies, and empathetic pedagogy. I don't yet feel like an expert in any one of these areas, but I have learned, <laughs> and I apologize for uh, what's going on here visually, um, I have learned that uh, the moving body reveals information about who we see ourselves to be, not just as dancers, but as believers and as human beings. As the body is a site of revealed knowledge and wisdom, it is also the site of change. Uh, since 2016, um, I've developed a 20-hour movement and leadership curriculum for girls and women using somatic principles to inspire bold living and bold leading. The program is called Moving Out Loud. Moving Out Loud brings about change by deepening perceptions of physical sensations within the body. Physical sensations such as the opening and closing of limbs and core, muscular binding and freeing, weight sensing and grounding, and personal kinesphere. The program provides participants with concepts and language to observe and describe these sensations in themselves and others. Participants make meaning of felt physical sensations by asking questions such as, where in my life do I experience this sensation? What associations? or memories or metaphors do I relate to this sensation? What cultural factors are at work in my experience of this physical felt sensation? With tools of deepened sensation, verbal concepts, and cultural context, participants are able to more proactively choose how to be in their bodies and how to be in their world. I currently teach in the dance department at BYU. For BYU dance majors and I, uh, let me back up a bit, um, the body is also a site for empathy and empathetic connection with others. Um, four students and I uh, recently collaborated with five Bangalore-based dance artists to research how somatic skills and sensibilities might expand the traditional model for learning and teaching choreography beyond merely learning steps and expand our capacity for more authentic, empathic engagement with one another. I also continue exploring how the body is used in expressions of devotion. Oh, let me turn this off. And have begun commissioning solos, um, exploring a search for the sacred from aesthetically and culturally diverse choreographers and will ultimately present them as an evening length performance. Um, because dance uses the body as the primary medium for generation and representation, for creative process and a final product, dance is a rich site of research where we as individual practitioners, as a faith community, and as a discipline can track the embodiment of ideology. It's where the rubber hits the road. I believe the body is divine in its design. It is not perfect, but perfect in its purpose in allowing us to connect more deeply with ourselves, with others, and with deity. Thank you.